Today we begin the last book of James, James chapter 5. James says, go to now ye rich men. We know that James has been addressing the issues in the church at the time. He's talking to church people. In the first six verses of chapter 5, James turns his attention to the rich men, wealthy men, men that maybe some of us may look up to. Notice in, the, in verse 1 it says, ye rich men, which indicates that these rich men were probably present at the time James was addressing the church. Also, probably James wanted to tell the church members something about these rich men. Who are these rich men? Why does James bother to address them? Well, he tells them straight up, go to now, which means leave now. James knows their hearts. They're filled with evil and corruption that will, you know, that will and has already affected the Christian church at the time. He says something similar in James chapter 4, verse 13, which we read a few uh, weeks ago. It says that James uh, gives the command to church members who were desiring and seeking to be rich. He tells them to go to now. The same phrase. James knows that they weren't focused on doing the Lord's work. They were more focused on becoming rich and gaining all the treasures. This reminds me of the story of Peter walking on water. You guys know the story very well. Peter is able to walk on water because he has his eyes focused on Christ. But the winds are blowing and the waves are, are, are moving all over the place. And all of a sudden, Peter takes his, his focus off of Christ and looks on the, on the water. And what happened to Peter? He begins to fall fall into the water. You see, just like Peter takes his, took his eyes off of Christ, if we too take our eyes off of Christ, we will fall. So we have to keep our eyes focused on Christ. James knows that those Christians who desire to become rich and the rich men were a cancer to the body of Christ. Although it doesn't say it in the Bible, I imagine that these rich men were coming to the church just to show off what they had. You know, they drive up in their Mercedes, Royals Royce, whatever luxury car they have. Some church member goes, oh man, that's a nice ride. Wish I had one like that. Maybe some church members are influenced by them. It's like, man, when I grow up, I'm going to be just like you instead of being just like Jesus. The influence of these rich men were affecting the Christian church. James took action by telling them to leave, but not leave, but leave now. Not just leave, but just leave now. Get out of here, because he doesn't want that influence to infiltrate the church. James tells them that they will reap and howl for their miseries that will come. Their miseries will come one day. They haven't came just yet. But what miseries is James talking about here? The rich men were accustomed to live in this lavish, lux luxurious uh, lifestyle. They had expensive clothes and shoes. They had the rarest vehicles on the planet Earth. They owned multiple properties. One day, they will lose all their riches and have to experience misery that James is talking about. Well, let's turn our Bibles to Revelations, the book of Revelations, chapter 22. The book of Revelations, chapter 22, which says, and behold, or verse 12, Revelations 22, verse 12 says, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according to his work, as his work shall be. So, God will come the second time. He will give everybody a, core, a reward according to their works here on earth. Because these rich men did not care about God or, or didn't care for God, God will give them a reward that none of us want. He continues, James continues in uh, chapter 5, verse 2. He says, your riches are corrupt. 
In the next few verses, James is going to expose how the rich become rich. James shares that these rich men were corrupt. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If they sow corruption, they will also reap corruption. You know, at my job, they have the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, the CBP, and they are daily present and active at our job. Well, one of the jobs that we have is uh, we line up containers, rows of containers with wide enough space that a truck can get through. And um, sometimes there's like 80 containers that are on the dock. Sometimes there's only 10 containers on the dock. But these are hand-picked containers. And, and so what they do is uh, we line them up. And Customs, the CPB, they come in with this big truck. And it starts to transform. And then it has an arm that comes out on the side. And so this truck glow, rides along the containers, and it scans inside the containers. You see, they're not only them, but the US Coast Guard are very active around my job as well. As I'm working, I see them jetting across the, the water in their boats with their um, 50 cal machine gun in front, going to inspect container ships that are coming in. And so a lot of things goes on during these, these, two, these, two, um, these two group of people, they're trying to stop the drugs from coming into the United States, the human trafficking, and whatever other corruptions that goes on. Well, this past week, my coworker um, sent me an article about a, a drug bust that they found, not at our port, but at the port of Philadelphia. They found a container with close to 20 tons of cocaine in there. And they found out that this container was owned by J.P. Morgan. And the reason why I share this story with you is because these rich people will do whatever it takes to get money. They love money more than God. Although it's not clear, I wouldn't doubt it if the bank had their hand in this corrupt opportunity that was going on. You see, James shares that their garments are moth-eaten. I imagine that these rich people's wardrobe was massive. They have multiple houses, so in those houses, in their rooms, they have walk-in closets, probably half the size of this church. They're so rich that they don't even buy cheap clothes, but they buy the most expensive clothes. They're so rich that they only wear these clothes once, and they'll never wear it again. So these clothes, they hang on the racks or folded in a drawer, and the moths come in and they start to feast on these clothing. James continues, he says, your gold and silver is cankered. He shares that their gold and silver is cankered. Gold and silver are the two most valuable and precious metals out there that people love the most. These metals refer to the riches. James says that their gold and silver is cankered, which means that something that is corroded, corrupt, destroyed, or irritated. So the riches are corroded. Corrosion is the deterioration of a metal as a result of chemical actions between it and the surrounding environment. Both the types of metals and the environmental conditions, particularly gases that are in the contact with the metal, determine the form and rate of deterioration. All metals can corrode. A small group of metals called the noble metals are much less reactive than others. As a result, they corrode rarely, or they rarely corrode. And these group of noble uh, metals are rodo, rodo, rhodium, Palladium, silver, platinum, and gold. These rich people accumulated so much wealth that it sits in their storehouse, wherever they may have it, and as time goes by, their riches begin to corrode and turn into rust. The rust uh, will become a witness against their riches. 
The SDA Bible Commentary, volume seven, page 537 says, this rust that marks unused possessions will be clear evidence against the rich and the day of judgment. Their money had been selfishly hoarded when it may have been used in the service for God and for man. I mean, this morning we were talking about how to give to homeless people or people that are asking in Sabbath school. Well, these rich people, they knew that there was a homeless problem back in those days, and instead of sharing a little wealth that they could have, they could have probably housed one of them and clean them up and probably get them a job or something. They wouldn't. It's like, I earned this money. It's my money. I'm not giving it away to nobody. I don't care who they are. Said the rust will eat at their flesh. Studies have shown that the damage of rust on the human body, uh, many and most nobly, are sensitive, and it causes a skin uh, redness and rashes. Exposure to rust, dust, uh, causes eyes, uh, the eye irritation, as well as other irritations. If taken in a large quantities, will lead to upset stomach irritation. The most serious damage of rust in the human body is the cause of inhalation of dust caused by rust, which can lead to a condition called siderosis. Uh, so iron oxide is deposited into the lungs. So this rust builds up in the air and they breathe it in and they become sick from this rust, spiritually speaking. Rust will eat at their skin as fire does, the Bible says. The rich have a firm grip on their rusty treasures, which hinders from them entering into heaven. Mark 8 verse 36 says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Turning to Matthew chapter 6, our scripture reading this morning. Matthew chapter 6, it says, Lay not yourselves treasures upon earth, where muth and rust doth corrupt, as we have learned as these rich men do. But it says in verse 20, Lay yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We should be careful, or we should not be like these rich men in accumulating treasures, treasures that will be corrupt, will be corroded by rust, or treasures that uh, will be moth-eaten. Besides, we can't take these treasures to heaven, right? Ellen White says, and God, Child Guidance, page 161. A character form, according to the divine likeness, is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. Those who are under the instruction of Christ and the world will take every divine attainment with them to the heavenly mansions. And in heaven, we are continuing to improve. How important, then, is the development of character in this life? So we can accumulate all this stuff here on this earth, but it's not going with us if we make it to heaven. So don't put your trust in your treasures, but put your trust in God. It says that the only thing we will take is our character. So we need to work on our character, that it is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Amen? He concludes verse 3 by saying, Ye heap treasures together for the last days. See, these rich men thought that they can buy their way into heaven. They would accumulate all this gold, and when Jesus comes again, he goes, here you go, let me buy my way into heaven. They lack, um, they failed to believe that heaven was, uh, is a free gift that was bought when Jesus sacrificed his life on the cross. The SDA Bible commentary says, the rich think to secure their future by an accumulation of material wealth. But in so doing, neglect that which would make them rich toward God. The reward that the ungodly rich have stored up will be the fire of God's wrath. Remember the verse we read earlier in Revelation 22, 12? This reward um, that the corrupt rich person will receive is the wrath of God. It says fire of the wrath of God. Verse 4 in James chapter 5 says... 
Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are answered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Sabaoth. So the employees work for these corrupt people, these rich men. They harvest all their lands in an agreement to get wages. Well, according to this, uh, this verse, that these employers, these rich men, didn't pay them their wages. They cheated them out. It says right here in the verse where it says, uh, you kept back by fraud. So their fraud, the Greek implies, that the wages have been continually, well, have been and continue to be withheld from the employees. The rich men probably had an agreement with the employees, but they broke their agreement by not paying their employees. The employees have no control over this. Although they tried, they argued, they wanted their wages, but they went and do the best thing they know how. They cried out to their big brother, Jesus, the Lord of Sabaoth. Hears their prayers, and he will answer their prayers. Amen? In verse 5, he says, Ye have lived in pleasures on earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Although they have a great amount of money and treasure stored away, they do not spend it or, or they spend it and have a good time. They enjoy the pleasures of this earth. These rich men probably did not go to uh, restaurants that weren't famous. It had to be a five-star restaurant or they're not eating there at all. These rich men would not drive in a Toyota Camry because they wanted to ride in a luxurious, luxury car, a Mercedes, Maserati, Rolls Royce, whatever they wanted. These rich men wore outfits, never wore outfits more than once. This type of living prepares their hearts for the day of slaughter. So what does that mean? I think about a cow, a life of a cow. All the cow does is just wander on the grass and eat, and eat, and get bulky and fat. And when uh, they see that that cow is nice and fat, they take it to the slaughterhouse. You see, these rich men probably did the same thing. They, they were feeding themselves with unspiritual things, feeding themselves, preparing themselves for the day of slaughter. Question, who wants to be like the rich men? Nobody? It says in verse 6, You have condemned and killed the just, the righteous men, and they do not resist you, right? So the righteous man does not resist them because they know that God, one day that God will vindicate them. Why does James take the time to address the rich men? What was his purpose? The Bible commentary says, James presents the position of the rich and proper perspective so the struggling, ill-clothed, poverty-stricken church members may not envy them. You see, there was a purpose for James to talk about the rich people and how they gain their riches and, and what do they do behind that. A lot of people, as I mean, some Christians, as we learn, they wanted to become like the rich men. These rich men had an influence on the church. So James addresses them and says, you don't want to be like them. Because if you be like them, this is the road that you will go down. He says, you don't want to go down that road. In no way should we be like the rich men, but rather we should be like Jesus. Amen? Well, how is Jesus? Was Jesus like the rich men? Was Jesus different? Let's find out. I know this is not familiar, I mean, it's familiar to you guys, but let's, let's look at a couple examples. You turn to Luke chapter 4. We're going to look at the life of Jesus. We're going to start off with his devotional life. What type of devotional life did Jesus have? Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Luke chapter 4 verse 16 says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. 
And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So Jesus goes to Nazareth, his hometown. And what was his custom? Was to go on the Sabbath day and stood up and read what? Huh? The Bible, what? The scriptures, right? To read the scriptures. Go to Luke chapter 2. So we know that God, Jesus, spent time um, reading the scriptures in church. Well, let's go to chapter 2. Look in verse uh, 40. We'll start in verse 42. It says, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolks and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. So they get a day's journey, and it was like, Jesus, come forward. And they were like, where's Jesus? Nobody knows where Jesus is at. So I know, mothers, you guys are very protective of your children. Twelve-year-old, a young child, you forget, in this big city of Jerusalem. How do you feel? They turned back immediately, right? They went back to look for Jesus. And it says, after three days, they finally found Jesus. Look in verse 30, 46. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him we're at in the temple if you were 12 years old would you be in the temple at the arcade I was thinking the same thing if I was in a big city that I never go to at the age 12 one I would be scared because I don't know where my parents are at two I would be excited because now I can explore and if I had that if I was 12 years old I wouldn't be in the temple honestly but they find Jesus in the temple sitting in the midst of doctors, people who are educated, people who are smart. And it says that they were both hearing them and asking them questions in verse 47. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So they're in the temple. They're not talking about you know, the things of this world or their favorite sports team. They're, probably, they're talking about the Bible. And Jesus is having this conversation with them at the age of 12. And these doctors, who probably spent about 10 years trying to get their doctorate degree, were amazed at what this, little, what this young man knew. So Jesus spent time in the Word. Not only did he spend time in the Word, he studied the Word. What else did he do with the Word? I shared last uh, a few weeks ago in the sermon in Matthew f chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 on the, the temptations of Jesus. Did Jesus have a Bible when he was being tempted? Well, you, can't, you can say he didn't have it physically, but he had it up here. So Jesus read the word, Jesus studied the word, and he put the word to memory. Amen? You think we could learn a lot from Jesus? We could learn a lot, right? Let's look at Jesus' prayer life. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Was Jesus a praying person? Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Mark chapter 1 and verse 35 says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he what? So Jesus woke up. Way before the sun rose, he went to another spot, you know, solitary place, a place that was quiet, a place that he knew he can connect with God. And what did he do there? He prayed, right? Go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Matthew 26 and verse 36, it says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And Jesus took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, and 
even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. And then uh, go down to uh, verse 40. It says, And he cometh unto his disciples, finding them what? Asleep. And saith unto them, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's getting ready to give his life ransom that we may have a second chance to eternal life. He brings three of the disciples with him. And what happens? He finds them sleeping. So Jesus encourages them to pray. Not only to pray, but to watch and pray. Go to verse uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, last example, and starting in verse 5. So Jesus prays. He encourages them to pray. He teaches them how to pray. Verse 5, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter in into thy closet, or in other words, remember Jesus woke up a great while before day, he went to a solitary place. In a closet, it is quiet. Nobody's going to bother you there. So it's similar. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth that uh, what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore pray ye, and you guys know the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And so Jesus teaches these people how to pray, because at that time, people were praying in a whole different way. Jesus not only taught them how to pray, but Jesus taught them many other things. Through the Gospels, you see the example of Jesus teaching in parables. He made life, uh, the, the, the teaching practical to everyday people. Jesus did miracles. He entered, uh, he turned water into wine, grape juice, uh, turned water into wine, which is grape juice. Jesus made the lame to walk, the blind to see, healed those who were demon-possessed, brought, uh, brought people back to life after they died, fed, multitude, uh, fed multiple times a multitude of people, and then the best miracle he ever did was, to, was a heart transplant in his disciples and in you and I. Amen.